We can go ahead and uh, open your Bibles this morning to the book of James, James chapter 1, verse 1. If you're using one of the black chair Bibles, I think it's 590, no, 950. <laughs> 950, 951, or if you've been with us long enough, maybe you've figured out how to find it. So James chapter 1, verse 1 is uh, where we're going to be at this morning. We, we've come to the end of this book, and in order to go to the end of the book, we actually have to go back to the beginning of the book and work our way through it uh, to conclude the study. And We're going to start with verse 1 and end with verse 20 of chapter 5. I don't want you to be concerned, though. Uh, we're not going to spend all afternoon here this morning. I'll give you time to go home and then come back for the Thanksgiving service later. Uh, this is going to be an overview. And as I mentioned last week, I'm, I'm, when I do the scripture reading this morning, I'm going to read the entirety of the book. That's something unusual. It's not something that we normally do here. And quite frankly, it's not something I've seen done anywhere. Uh, but I like to do it at the end of a study of a book if it's small enough and we can fit it into one service, I like to read the entirety of it because I think it helps us with context, especially after we've spent so much time digging in to now kind of step back and listen to it all together. And, and it will take us, if you will, down memory lane <laughs> to what we have studied and bring those truths back, but pull them all together. And uh, so hopefully that's what we'll do as we read through it. So um, this will give us a refresher on the book, keep everything in its context. Um, but then when we get to the end of the reading, we'll base our review off of those last two verses there. Um, our study of uh, this little letter by James, and James, remember, is the half-brother of Jesus. Uh, they had the, the, uh, the same mother, but uh, James was the, the son of Joseph, whereas... Jesus, our Lord, is the Son of God. Uh, they are half-brothers. Uh, we, we've called this study Proven Faith because in it, James is seeking to challenge his readers on the authentic, authenticity of their faith. In other words, claiming to be a Christian is not enough. Claiming to have faith is not good enough. Your faith that you have must be genuine faith. We just sang some songs, beautiful songs, talking about faith and and faith that believes in the power of Christ to change, to cancel sin, to transform our lives. That's living faith that we sing about. But many in the world claim to have faith. Many within the church in the, in the walls of Christendom claim to have faith. But what does that faith look like? Is it genuine and is it living? So James is calling us to consider that, to look at the testing of life and see how we respond. Does your faith hold up? Does it prove to be true through the refinement of testing? Well, this is what James is asking us uh, to consider and look at here. So as I read the letter in its entirety, I'm going to ask that you listen and that you examine your faith again. And uh, since, since I'm going to be reading such a lengthy passage of Scripture here, in fact, it's going to take about if I timed it right, 16 minutes just to read the passage, I'm not going to make you stand this morning. I'll allow you to, uh, to sit, but please sit uh, with a, uh, a reverent heart, um, or if you will, to, to invert what the little boy said where when he was disciplined and told he had to sit down, he said, I'm sitting on the outside, but I'm standing on the inside in rebellion. Well, this way you can submit on the outside, but you can stand in your heart on the inside in honor of the reading of the word. <laughs> How's that? Let's look to the book of James. James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that man must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the, brother of, let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation. Because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. 
For the sun rises with its scorching heat and it withers the grass. The flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth. <clears throat> of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. <clears throat> For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and widows in their affliction and keep, him, keep oneself unstained from the world. My beloved, or my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in, the Lord, in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you, sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you, stand over there, or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who, those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you were called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of, of, of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery but murder... You have become a transgressor of the law. So, speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? <clears throat> if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body. What good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But some will say, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. You want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? 
You see, that faith was active along with his works. And faith was, a com- was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see, that you, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. For you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is perfect, a perfect man, able to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest fire is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and, a, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird and of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is to no purpose that the scripture says, He yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord and he will exalt you. Do not speak evil against one another, brothers. The one who speaks against a brother or judges his brother speaks evil against the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is only one lawgiver and judge. He who is able to save and destroy. But who are you to judge your neighbor? Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we'll go into such and such a town and spend a year there and trade and make a profit. Yet you do not know what tomorrow will bring. What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time and then vanishes. 
Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. So whoever knows to do the right thing and fails to do it, for him, it is sin. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasures in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and mourned the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard, the ste- heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that he that whoever let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Father, thank you so very much for your word this morning and the broad and lengthy reading of this letter that James has written that is inspired by the Spirit of the living God. It is profitable for us to reprove us, to instruct us. Father, help us to submit ourselves to it. These, these truths that ring now in our ears, may they be supplanted in our hearts and grafted into us. And may you grant us faith to believe and to be transformed by them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's cover a few things here as we wrap up, huh? Last week when we, uh, we were finishing the few verses before here, we, we noticed that really we began the conclusion that James has to his letter And in it, uh, he asked four questions in the conclusion. If you recall, last week we covered the first three questions. Is anyone suffering? And the answer to that question was, pray. And if you recall, our scripture here, the ESV translates it, let him pray, almost like it's an option. It really is an imperative. This is what you're to do. Is anyone suffering? Pray. That's the answer. And, And in like manner, the second question, is anyone cheerful? Praise. Sing praise is what we're to do. And the third question, is anyone sick? And the same kind of answer, call the elders. Let's call the elders for prayer, to pray over them. Uh, Each one of those questions, in fact, addresses how we view prayer. 
Do we view it as something we run to in the midst of our suffering? Do we view prayer as the, as the means through which we offer praise and thanksgiving and, and, and glory to God for the cheerful heart he's given to us? Do we view pray, prayer as the means through which we are healed and our sins are forgiven? Each of those questions addresses how we view it. They're similar in their nature, and they're all serious in their nature. But now as James does close this book with these last couple of verses, he, he does so with a fourth question, and this one is a little bit different than the last three, but it's also the most serious of, the last three, of those four questions. Because in this, he addresses the wanderer. The wanderer is the one who claims faith but then wanders away. The one who professes Christ but doesn't seem to change in life. Or gives the appearance of a change in life but then starts to wander back into the old ways. This is the one who comes along for a season but when things get difficult or the trinkets of life become more attractive than Christ, he wanders off. In fact, Jesus gave an illustration about this when he talked about various kinds of soil and the seed of the gospel being sown. Some being a hard and trodden down ground and the seed of the gospel has no opportunity to take root. It's swept away. The other three kinds of soil, they take root. One of them being a rocky soil where it can only go down so far with its roots so the plant springs up and gives all the appearance of being an attractive and luscious plant. But then the sun comes out, it dries the shallow ground where the roots lie, and the plant just withers away. The third kind is the the kind that seems to grow up as well and look good, but then the thorns and the thistles and the weeds come in and they choke the life from it and the plant withers and dies. And finally, that fourth kind is the kind where the ground is ready and prepared and it grows and produces fruit with deep running roots. And of course, that's a spiritual application. That first kind on the, falling on the path, the gospel message is swept away. The person never believes. The one with the stones in the ground or the hard bedrock is the one who believes, gives the appearance of belief for a period. But when things get difficult, they just give up and walk away. The third is the one who gives all the appearance as well of believing. But then the cares of this life, the trinkets of the earth, the joys and the pleasures of creation sweep them away and choke any spiritual life out of them. And it is only in that fourth and good ground that's been prepared and plowed and broken up. It's ready to receive the gospel where the roots can run deep and it can withstand the storms that there is true and genuine faith. James, in like manner, is calling us to consider that. And so when he speaks about a wanderer, he speaks about one who is one of those three latter three categories there. Either he's one like the plant whose roots only run so deep and now the heat is coming and they're going to prove that they really don't believe. Or two, they're getting choked out by the cares of the world and they're going to reveal they don't really believe. Or it's three, in which the roots will push through any kind of bedrock that's there. And the chokes, the, the, the weeds and the thorns that, that, that grow up and try to choke it out by the, by the miraculous work of the vine dresser himself, they'll be peeled away and pulled apart and the plant will grow. The wanderer falls into one of those three categories. The wanderer is one who heads back into the world. So this is a good concluding question of James because it seems to summarize what he's been talking about in the entire letter. It encapsulates the goal of the writing of his letter to call out to the wanderer to check his faith and maybe call him back and save his soul. So the question is, if anyone wanders, my brothers, verse 19, if anyone wanders, this is chapter 5, the last two verses, my brothers, if anyone wanders, Or if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Notice that he starts this letter with the same little phrase of comfort and equality that he has used throughout the letter and that he uses right here towards the end. And that little phrase is, my brothers. It's a simple title, but it reminds us of a few important factors. One, that he's speaking to the church. This is not a letter written to outsiders. He's not writing this as a a sermon to religious Jews who need to be introduced to their Messiah. 
He's not writing this to the Roman and Greek pagans who need to learn of the one true God and abandon their pantheon of gods. No, James is writing this to the church, to those who are inside the family, those who are under the covenant banner and authority of a local body. Yet, the seemingly strange thing about this letter then is that it's evangelistic in its nature. James is calling out with the gospel to the church. And this is important because what it does is remind us that not all who profess Christ are in Christ. Just because somebody is faithful to come and be involved in, inside within the walls of the church does not mean they really are born of God. Just because somebody ardently swears and promises that they are born again doesn't mean that they really are. The second note of this little of this title that we can get from it and the fact that he's saying, my brothers, it tells us that James is speaking to those who claim to be in Christ. Not just the church in general, but specifically to individuals within the church who claim to be in Christ. There are some who do not know Christ, though they think they do. They have what Paul called the appearance of godliness, but deny its power. 2 Timothy 3.5 they claim faith, but they deny the power to change them. So there's no fruit, no evidence, no transition in life. Oh, I believe. Well, how's that changed you? Well, it hasn't. Well, throughout the letter here, we see these evangelistic notes. They kind of come along and say, you think you have faith? Prove it. You think you've got faith? Prove it. You think your faith is real and genuine and living? Prove it. The third little side note here from this title, My Brothers. In it, James lets us know that he's speaking not just to us, but as one of us. And this is important too because remember, James is the half-brother of Jesus. He could have titled the letter saying, James, the half-brother of our Lord to give some measure of, I don't know, authority, I guess we would presume, arrogance. He could have titled the letter, James, an apostle to grant authority. James, the, the lead and senior teaching pastor of the most prominent church of the first century. But that's not how he does it. Instead, he says... Uh, my brothers, my brothers. There's humility in that. Because what he's saying is, I'm one of you. I'm battling through this life to be like Christ, just like you are. I'm struggling and battling with faith, just like you are. I'm one of you. So as I ask you, I ask myself, is my faith re real? Can it be proven? This also gives us a bit of a sobering perspective here as we think it through. Because uh, often we think we're safe. And that is true. I, I have faith. I believe. I'm confident that I am safe and secure. But will I always be? be because... If you don't endure to the end, then it reveals that your faith was never true. I have to keep on going. I have to keep persevering until the very last breath I breathe. It would be such a shame to fight for 95 years and in the last year curse God and die. Have your faith crumble away. Got to keep checking my faith. I got to keep examining. Is it, is it proven? Is it, is it real? This is a reminder that we always need to check our faith so that we don't wander from the faith. Brothers, the Christian life is not a decision that you made 20 years ago. 
It's an ongoing, life-changing fight. So we need to regularly check our faith. We need to see if it's being proven. There's no room for, for arrogance, the kind of arrogance that says, oh, I got saved 20 years ago. I got nothing to worry about now. I'm secure. I have nothing. There's nothing that can steal away my faith. So it really doesn't matter how I live. The whole books of James is written to remind us that how we live matters. Because real, living, genuine faith is always working. It's constantly changing us. So we have to look at our lives. We have to look at our faith. Do we still believe? And as James closes this letter, he gives us insight into this goal in his writing. He addresses two people in these last couple of verses. He addresses the wanderer and he addresses the rescuer. First, the wanderer. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Let me address this first person here as we get started so that we know who he is. He is among the church. James calls him a brother. He's among us, James says. If anyone among you wanders, What is he wandering from? He's wandering from the truth. Truth can be a a difficult concept for our culture to grasp. It really seems bizarre for me even to say it. But truth has become a difficult concept for our generation to grasp. Because we live in an age of of subjectivism. We live in an age where everything is subject to your wants and to your beliefs. Whatever you want, you get to decide. Whatever it means, it means to you. It's subjective in how you view it and how you understand it. We live in an age of relativism where everything is relative. So truth is viewed as relative to our situation and subjective to our desires. Therefore, truth in this mindset becomes personal. My truth, your truth. My truth might differ from your truth. And of course, if you let a logical mind rest on that, it, it, it just doesn't work. And yet, we're taught now for the last couple of generations here, there are no absolutes. Truth is not absolute. It's subjective. It flows. It's personal. It's individual. But there's no stable ground to stand on. This leads to all kinds of warped and skewed thinking. So what happens? We begin to fight battles about life. When does life begin? Why do we need to battle about when does life begin? Because we want to kill a life that we don't desire to have. I don't want this person to exist. I want to know how I can kill them without it being murder. Therefore, let's begin to wrestle with what is truth about when life begins. That's the only reason we have a battle over when life begins. We battle over when life ends or when a life is no longer viable, useful. Why do we battle over euthanasia? Because we want to kill human beings that we deem a burden to us. And we want, to have a, we want to justify it. So we battle over what is truth about life. We battle over marriage. What is truth about marriage? How is it defined and what quantifies or qualifies a marriage? What are the parameters of it? What does the word mean? You think it means one man and one woman. I think it must mean something else. I want it to mean something else, so we'll change truth and conform it to what I want. And now we have a fight, a battle over truth. Why? Because I want to give in to my lusts without having a judgy eye from you. (laughs) Don't you tell me what's right and wrong. This is truth to me. Now we've skewed to the point we battle over male and female, sex and gender. So that 
I can shift like the sands with my identity. Today I want to be this, tomorrow I want to be that. And not only that, I want you to know what it is that I want to be today without me telling you, you have to know ahead of time. And, and we have just created this utter mess. Why? Because I don't like what I am and I want to pass blame to God. It must be his fault. So truth becomes whatever I want it to be. It becomes subjective. We have, we have sought to water down, mix, and pollute truth so that we cannot recognize what it is anymore and all that is left is utter madness. But as James notes here, and as the Bible is clear throughout, there is only one truth. There simply is truth. It's not subjective, it's not relative, and it doesn't change. It just is. It's not yours and it's not mine. It simply is. Truth is a fixed entity that is woven into the fabric of creation. It's not up for debate. It's not up for pollution. It's not up for distortion. And no matter how much you want to debate or how much we try to pollute or how much we try to distort it, it doesn't change the fact. Truth is truth. And there is only one. It's absolute. It is an, an eternal an eternally existent characteristic of the God who is the creator of all things. That's what truth is. It's a characteristic of the self-existent, eternal God who spoke all things into creation. He alone has the authority to say, this is truth. And he wove it into creation. And no matter how we seek to distort it, we cannot change it. We can surrender to it, we can embrace it, we can obey it, or we can reject it. But we can't change it. And rejection has consequences. As noted here, James is pointing out to the one who has walked into the church, professed to believe the truth, to follow the truth, to obey the truth, and now they're wandering from the truth. You want to know what this is in the light of Scripture and how James says we should view it? He says it's sin. It's sin. You'll see this in, in how you see that James links the wanderer to sin in verse 20 when he makes it very clear that the goal is to bring back a sinner from his wandering. So the wanderer, the one who is wandering away, is described as one who is a sinner. Because to leave and abandon truth is sin. To distort and wrestle and change and try to pollute and tweak truth is sin. You should also note here that the real danger of the wanderer for his sinning is because it leads to death. Now, this is not the kind that is, was talked about in the verses earlier leading to a, a physical sickness that would lead to a physical death here. That, that we cry out to the elders and we pray with and maybe perhaps God delivers us from that sickness. That's not what James is talking about. Paul addressed uh, believers in the church who were in sin and they were so entrenched they were becoming sick even to the point of death. That's not what James is talking about here. This is an eternal death. This wandering away from truth leads to an eternal death. It is a soul that will die. This language of James indicates the real and eternal danger here. What he is addressing is the unpardonable sin. Jesus called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit as a sin that will not be forgiven neither in this age or in the age to come, Matthew 12, 32. We quantify this as the unpardonable sin. It will not be forgiven. What is that? It's wandering away to, to the point where you have tasted the goodness of God and found it wanting. You have seen the Holy Spirit and His work of salvation in the lives of those around you. You've seen the transforming effect of genuine sanctification of faith at work. You have learned of the work of Christ on the cross to pardon sinners like you and me. And you have decided that you prefer the ways of the world. You prefer your sin 
over the Savior. And by rejecting Christ, you blaspheme the Holy Spirit. This will cost you your soul. That's what James is saying. The wanderer who wanders away into a sin, his soul is at risk. What is at risk of? Eternal death in the torment of a holy God's wrath or of God's holy wrath. This is the state of the wanderer. This is the position that he finds himself in. The second person mentioned in these couple of verses here is the rescuer. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back the sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. The rescuer here is the one who turns the wanderer back. I thought about trying to follow the language of the Scriptures because I like to do that if there's a, a word in the verse that makes the point. I want to stick with it so it ties right in. And the word that would be in the passage here, because this is dealing with salvation, so the word that you would link in the passage here would be the Savior. That's the kind of language here. The, the one who rescues the wanderer will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So that idea is the Savior, but in Christianity we, we reserve that title for Christ. This passage is not pointing to Christ here as the Savior, as the Rescuer, but it's to the Christian. So the Savior here is with a little s. That's why I chose Rescuer, because I thought it might be a little more clear in our minds, easier to avoid confusion. See, the word Him in verse 20, that's pointing back to the someone in verse 19. The someone in verse 19 is a brother in the church. It's a, a fellow Christian who is reaching out to a sinner, a, another professing Christian who's now wandering away from the faith. He's reaching out to him and rescues him. Notice again how James begins this verse, my brothers. My brothers. The reason I bring it up again is because James is not saying, dear elders, you're teaching pastors. He's pointing to the fellow Christians in the church and saying, brothers, my brothers. In other words, the, rescuer is, the rescuers are from among us. And there is a responsibility with every member in the church to be a rescuer and rescue one another. When you see a professing Christian wandering, don't ignore it. Don't think, well, I sure hope the elders know what's going on. I sure hope the elders are reaching out to them. No. According to James, you need to do it. Reach out and rescue. Call the wanderer out for his sin and point him back to the gospel. Warn him how dangerously close he is to the edge of the cliff. How do you... How do you Rescue a wanderer? You, you run up to them and you stop them. Hey, I see the path you're going on. I don't know if you're aware of this, but it leads over the edge to, to death. And that's where you're headed. Come back. Come back. You're wandering from the faith. You say you believe, but you're not acting like it. You can even call yourself the rescuer when you go to him. I'm here to rescue you because I think you're wandering. Use the language of the scripture. Just call your brother back. Why? Because he's beginning to love the world and the things of the world. You need to run to him and remind him that friendship with the world is enmity with God. And whoever makes himself a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You need to warn him that he's trying to serve two masters and remind him that he cannot serve both God and money. You need to call out to the one who is dabbling in sin and warn him of the death that comes to the sinners because you will not inherit the kingdom of God. These warnings are still true even though you've professed Christ. You need to run to your brother who's wandering and point him to the parable of ten virgins 
and their oil lamps. And that remind them that by fooling about with sin, they will not be ready for the bridegroom to return. Why do we do this? Because you know what? It's not easy to do. It sounds good in a room like this as we talk about it, but you know, when the rubber meets the road and you're there and you know they're wandering away and you're looking at it going, I know, but man, they don't want to hear from me. And if I say something to them, boy, they're, they're probably going to blow up at me. They're going to they're gonna say, you know, I'm, I'm overreacting. Why do we do this anyways? Well, one, because we're told to do it. That should be sufficient, okay? You want to be obedient to God, you do what he says. And the second reason, because eternity is at stake. Eternity is at stake. Just because somebody has claimed faith doesn't mean that they have real faith. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7? He said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? If I had to paraphrase on, did we not claim faith in your name? Did we not walk an aisle in your name? Did we not say a prayer in your name? Did we not go to church in your name? Did we not give money in your name? Jesus' words of Matthew 7, 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Why do we run out and call out to the wanderer? Because eternity is at stake. We're to reach out to one another. You know why else we do? I think the 18th century hymn writer Robert Robinson nailed it. When he wrote the words, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. You know why you rescue a wandering brother? Because you are prone to wander in your heart. And you need your fellow believers to rescue you. I am prone to wander in my heart and I need you to rescue me. We, we read Psalm 121 this morning as the God who keeps. And, and, I, and I promise you, I promise you that, that God has secured our salvation. He is the one who keeps us. And he will not lose any that the Father has given to the Son. But understand this. The rescuing of the wanderer by the body of Christ is the means through which God does his keeping. What a privilege. What a privilege. Rescuing a wandering brother, I would argue, is what James is doing in his letter here. James writes with a pastor's heart to a congregation that's scattered and suffering, but more importantly, he writes as a brother, a fellow believer, a fellow Christian, and a Christian who is prone to wander. One who would want his own faith checked by his brothers. In fact, you might title the letter, To the Wanderer, A Challenge to Your Faith. Seems to be what he's doing here. He writes to the believers and he presses them to prove their faith. Here's a a quick overview, and it's a very quick overview of this book, just to remind you of this rescue effort. He starts the book by challenging the wanderer who claims faith but seems to crumble under the trials of life and starts to look for any way out. And he teaches us in the opening verses that genuine faith is proven through joy. Chapter 1, verse 2, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Secondly, he challenges the wanderer who claims to have faith in Christ, but lives a disobedient life. I believe in Jesus, but there's no evidence of it, no obedience in their life. He teaches us that genuine faith is proven through obedience saying in chapter 125, but the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Third, 
He challenges the wanderer who claims to have faith, but is always fighting and striving with others. And in that, he is teaching us that genuine faith is proven through peace. James 3, 17, but the, wisdom is, but the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere, and a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Genuine faith is proven by peacemakers. Fourth, James challenges the wanderer who claims to have faith but is so consumed with the things of the world that they have no desire No desire of or delight in Christ or the eternal. And he teaches us that genuine faith is proven through future vision. What are we looking towards? James 5, 7, Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. Why lay up treasures in the last day? Look. Look and patiently wait for the coming of the Lord. Long for the coming of the Lord. Genuine faith is proven because we have a vision of eternity. And finally, the fifth was that he challenges the wanderer who claims to have faith but does not look to the Lord in prayer, teaching us that genuine faith is proven in prayer. James 5.16, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. Genuine faith believes that God hears and answers prayer. And he runs to it. James wrote this letter some 2,000 years ago, 6,000 miles away from here, so that when we read it here at Christian Bible Church in Mohawk, New York, in late November 2023, We again, just like the readers before, are challenged to examine our faith. He wrote it. He wrote it to those who are prone to wander so that we might be called out and be called back. So that we would examine and challenge and look at what James is saying and say, Is this me? Is my faith true? And then we might be motivated to run to one another because we love one another. And when we see somebody wandering, say, hey, brother, is your faith real? We are to do the same thing that James has done. That's why he's written this. Look again at verse 20 in the closing words. Let him him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. By calling out to the wanderer, we might be the means through which God saves and brings back the wanderer under the grace and mercy of God, back under the covering of the righteousness of Christ. Now please understand when James says here that you're going to cover a multitude of sins here, he's not not suggesting that we're going to hide sins. He's not saying "Come, come, come back and you can cover all of their sins up and nobody will have to know about it. Covering sins never works. Hiding sin, I should say, never works. And James is not suggesting that we're going to hide sins. Rather, what he is saying is that bringing the wandering sinner back brings them back under the banner of Christ and under the cloak of His righteousness so that their sin is now covered under the righteous robes of Christ. This is not only our privilege to be used by God in this capacity. It is our responsibility. And it's not only our responsibility, it's our joy. And it's our request. Because not only is it a joy to call out and and take joy in a wandering believer coming back, it's my request that when I wander, He would call me back. And don't let me wander very far. Call me quickly. This is the work of the body of Christ. This is the work of the church. To turn one another back 
from wandering and to keep each other safe in the love of God, a love that covers the multitude of sins. You say you have faith? Prove it. Let's pray. Father, we come again at the end of this study and give you thanks and praise for you are the God who keeps. You are the God who gives faith. You are the God who gives life-changing, life-transforming faith. Father, I pray that your spirit would move and grant that faith where it's necessary and that your words would call us out as we wander to to come back and to again examine our faith and to allow your, your spirit and the trials and sufferings and struggles of life to prove it, to reveal that it is true. And, oh God, would you continue to keep us till the last day. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.